this week. And I, I took a link with them. So basically, that means that they, they would uh, serve it if, if a customer is able to take the credit. Yeah, the credit, credit or no credit. credit yeah. Yeah. So that for, for if you have a problem, you can. And then the if you have a minor problem, then mm -hmm. you may come back three years later. Yeah. They told you what the problem was. <coughs> okay, we're on. Okay. Okay, thank you. Welcome, everybody. Thank you for showing up. Uh, this is uh, 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 something that actually I kind of uh, I'm proud to, uh, to introduce in the sense where I got interested in this topic myself uh, about a year ago. And uh, it's a pleasure to have here uh, Dr. Prutti from LSU. Dr. Prutti got his PhD in mathematics from uh, uh, Louisiana State University. And uh, he's uh, by training, he's a pure mathematician, but he, you know, he's got the good sense of actually being interested in applications these days. <laughs> so he's going to talk to us about how the, uh, algebraic topology can actually be uh, used, uh, put to good use, rather, in uh, uh, robot motion planning. And uh, it's a pleasure to have you here. Thank you. The floor is yours. Yeah, first of all, I would like to thank uh, Dr. Hamid for inviting me here. I'm very glad to have the opportunity to talk to you. And um, thanks for coming. So um, this is a joint work uh, with my advisor, Dr. Cohen. Uh, at the beginning, I'm going to talk about configuration spaces uh, in robotic situations and define what is the motion planning we are actually studying and namely invariant topological complexity and after that uh, we talk more detailed how we calculate this invariant this numeric number and uh, for this particular space is so-called in tori and subcomplexes of tori and some examples related to that. <coughs> and before I go further, uh, would you please switch me to document camera? Oh, okay. So I want to talk about first um, linkages, uh, what configurations we have in this scenario. We consider, for example, planar linkages. This is fixed here, these two points down, and this is a si one of the simplest examples which moves around. So this can rotate this way, and correspondingly, it forced to rotate second leg on corresponding way. Uh, we can actually, one can take a little bit more linkages here, and uh, which contains more arms. And if you actually want to classify what is corresponding configuration space, uh, one can try to rotate this on clockwise, and this goes another way around. And there's a little bit one more step when one can actually rotate on opposite way. So in most scenarios, it would be just a uh, union of two circles, or depending on what the sizes are of these legs, let's say L1, L2, L3, and L0, it might be happening that it's a little bit more in world space rather than just a smooth manifold. Yeah, another way to approach this uh, is uh, one of the problems when we have several robots and each one is understood as a point. 
either on factory floor or just some more complicated plain region which has some obstacles. And let's say it is just simple take, uh, take R2. This is a plane. And we have the points x1, xn. Each point in the plane represents each robot. And uh, the configuration of the space would be uh, all the n tuples. It's denoted by Cn of, in this case, R2. So this is a space which has x1 up to xn, where xi is different from xj, i different from j. So otherwise, we say the motivation is we don't want that robots uh, to collide. And we want to have this motion so that um, we can control. And if there are some additional obstacles in the plane, then we take these points out of possibility that uh, Xn cannot be arbitrary, but rather only uh, avoid these additional obstacles. And configuration space, in this case, in the original space is uh, we just have this R2 times R2 Euclidean product n times, but we are removing fat diagonal. Fat diagonal means that uh, coordinates cannot coincide uh, pairwise. So anytime we have two coordinates are the same, then we remove out of consideration so that uh, no, no two robots can collide. So this one of the example of con configuration space. Uh, one more is robot arm. So we can consider this as some linkage right here. And it can rotate clockwise or counterclockwise arbitrarily. So each one has parameter t1, angular parameter t2, and here t3. And we can take, for example, t4. Uh, also, one can incorporate, in, incorporate inside that we can shift and make arm larger or longer each side. And uh, what will be configuration space in this case? Then this rotation of one around one joint uh, is independent of another joint and so on. So each joint basically is parameterized by circle S1. So two independent rotation result in configuration, which is S1 times S1, two parameters, and so on in this particular picture. We have one, two, three, four links, which can, uh, yeah, let's fix this originally. So one, two, three, four. So it will be S times S times S times S1, four times. And depends on how much we have inside. So it is assuming this is planar rotation. If there are some additional spherical rotation possible, then corresponding product would uh, change to S2 or some open subspace or closed subspace of S2. So in general, basically, one can consider any reasonable topological space as just configuration of some mechanical system. So we can talk about X as a topological space. In the previous example, what topology means that uh, two points are close if each corresponding angular uh, shifts are close to each other. Or we can define actually the metric as well. The goal of motion planning is
then we have arbitrary two points uh, to, conf to configuration <coughs> x1, x2. And what we want actually, so let's take this space, x1, x2. We want to construct the path so that brings initial configuration for uh, terminal configuration. And um, there could be done several cases. Like, for example, we want that robots are located this way somehow. And sometime later, it will change to another configuration. How actually we want to change from here to there? And what we are looking for is uh, so-called continuous motion planners, which means this particular path, which depends on initial and terminal configuration, of course, can be chosen several times. But we want to assign one unique path, which can say to this uh, system that go from here to here only with this way. And after that, uh, we want that initial and terminal configuration continuously give the corresponding paths of shifting from here to here. So so-called continuous time motion planning. And uh, basically, it is, uh, can I go briefly to five, please? Yes, um, <coughs> we have again pair of the states and output should be continuous motion of the system which starts at the initial stage and ends at the desired state. And basically this was considered by uh, Latombe or Scharrer mathematicians or which are theoretical robotics uh, person this uh, first additionally. But uh, this topological insight and bringing algebraic topology uh, brought by Michael Farber which uh, had some papers in 2001, 2002, and so on. And um, we started basically so-called navigation and complexity. So let me define what motion planner is in this scenario. So since we have this one particular configuration space, we consider subsets of a couple and continuous maps so that we can divide these are pairwise disjoint and additionally the whole F1 union up to FK covers the entire X. Let me say one thing, what is the motivation? Why we do we do so much, so many set coverings? In general, if um, topological space is not simple in the sense of homotopy. For example, if you take the plane and remove the point, the whole thing cannot be shrinked to one point itself. So topology of plane and topology of with the whole of the plane differ from each other. And this remote point, that means annulus, is not contractible to a point. And once we have any non-trivial topology, it causes that we cannot define global continuous motion planning on the entire system, because that's exactly where topology lies inside. So the Farber proved that topological space x is contract contractible to, to the point if and only if corresponding uh, motion planning problem has globally defined um, continuous mapping. And one can actually check this uh, using some algebraic homotopy. I don't want to go to detail in this case. So anytime we take x is not simple, like in the previous scenario we had product of circles for linkages. Circle is already something which has non-trivial topology on it. And it cannot be contracted to the point. So even one single linkage, uh, one, one single this simple arm cannot be programmed in the way that uh, this motion planning will be defined globally on that. So therefore, we just divide the entire product. Product means choosing initial and terminal stages. And we define so that on each particular fi, on each subset, uh, we do have this 
motion planning. Otherwise, to say if the point is in first or second and some other corresponding subsets, then we know that any couple has uniquely chosen parts from first to a second terminal configuration. Yeah, there's some uh, mathematical terminology here, but um, we just talk about this fi subspaces as local domains so that on which we actually have global defined motion planning. Now, next question is, how can we optimize that? That means what is the minimum number so that we can cover this x times x by so-called uh, motion planners? And we can define topological complexity of x to be the minimum number so that we have corresponding optimal coverage. So and that will be definition of topological complexity. Yeah, this was defined by Farber. And what we want to do is to calculate this. And this actually appears to be a topological invariant in the sense that if we deform the space x itself into itself somehow, um, then this number is not changing. So one way would be to deform so that we can reduce to simple case and after then study this for simplified x. And uh, using the homotopy backwards, we can actually shift corresponding mo motion planning to this simplified space to original domain. Could I ask a question? Yes, sure. If you go back one slide, can you do that? Yes. Your, your subsets and your space, OK? Uh, the x is the space in which you're moving. And then x axis, the x cross x is, is the map from one to another then. Can, can you give me a little insight as to, to how a path from point X to point Y is represented here? I gather that, that you know, the, the point pairs or something are in there. Is that possible? Or is it too elementary? Uh, you mean how we define the path? Or in other words, you, 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 you gave before an example of a path. Oh, yeah, sure, actually. A, you know, one to one, but, but, I, but I'm, I'm having trouble imagining how that path fits into the uh, objects that you're defining here. Okay, can you please switch to me the camera Correct. back, please? Yeah. yeah. So let me discuss this on a very easy, non-trivial, simple example, which is circle. Is that answering your question? Yeah. So we have circle S1. So our space X is circle. This corresponds to one rotational possible possibility. This has one degree of freedom. So now we have points. Let's talk it X and Y. So assume these are two robots. Or just actually, uh, let's say this way. In this particular case, it would be just two configuration, which is rotation with some angle. Let's say this arbitrary starting point T parameter, angular parameter. And we have two configurations. And the question is, we want to move position y to x or vice versa. Let's say we have x, y, so that we want to go from x to y with some path. Let's call it gamma, which depends on x and y, so that it will be continuously depending on x and y. So of course, there are several choices. As I mentioned already, there's no way to globally define this on entire S1 times S1. So what we do is actually is uh, we divide this Euclidean product uh, into Cartesian product in, in this particular case, two is enough, two subspaces is enough to globally construct motion plan on each subspace F1 and F2. So for example, what would be reasonable choice of F1. So we can take all the points x, y, such that x is not antipodal for y. 
So if the points are not on opposite way, then we can basically construct a unique path with uh, timing 0, 1, so that second goes, first point goes to second from the shortest distance. So this will be 1, F1. And on F2, corresponding path would be, first of all, F2 would be remaining path, which was x with negative x, where x is arbitrary on S1. And right now, the question is, when we have two points opposite to each other, how we want to move from this point to another point? And of course, there's two choices, one way, counterclockwise or clockwise. And right now, we just define, let's say, choose only clockwise rotation. So we choose first point to antipodal point by clockwise rotation. And that will define uh, motion planner on entire configuration of one linkage. Okay. Did I answer your question? So. Yeah. The only problem is that, again, this has non-trivial topology, so there's no way to uniquely guarantee uh, to guarantee that there is only one global defined stuff. So that's why we need to define at least two subsets which moves that. And of course, in this case, this will be optimal as well because we know that um, S1 has non trivial topology, so there is no way to reduce the number of these planners to one. Okay, and the union of F1 and F2 covers all possible. Exactly, because we choose already that one is not antipodal and second is already that uh, they could be opposite to each other. And this definitely is, uh, yeah. satisfies definition of uh, motion planner. Okay. Yeah, thank you for your question. Uh, that's a very good point. Let me uh, say what is going on in second case when x is S2. So when do we have the sphere? Sphere is completely different from circle in the sense that uh, it basically will have a little bit more complications. And namely, even though we can squeeze two non-antipodals to each points to each other together with the shortest distance, the problem is when we have these two points antipodal to each other, so there is no uniquely defined direction, and we cannot choose corresponding field so that we can say this point should go to antipodal with this direction. And this uh, topology creates necessity to put additional third subspace, which will be F1 would be the same as X is different from negative Y. F2 would be antipodal points, X negative X, such that we just choose one point, A0, on this space. And now we choose antipodal point as far as uh, this x is different from a null. And f3 would be just a couple of two points, a null, negative, a null. So how are we going to construct right now motion planner here? We just, in the first part, we understand that for the second part, we define vector field on the sphere, but the problem is we cannot define which is non-zero at any point, but eventually one can define vector field on the sphere so that it has only one zero. So at each other point, we can choose corresponding direction uniquely according to this vector field, and with this direction, we go through corresponding large semicircle going through this direction. And the remaining uh, set after F1 and F2 would be just one this point which at which this vector field degenerates. And therefore, we can go from here to opposite point, any kind of chosen path. And this will be three uh, different, this will be three motion planners on S2. And now the question is why exactly uh, this is the minimum and why we cannot reduce to number two. Of course, there are several motion planners, but we are looking for what is the minimum, right? And um, we can answer this question using algebraic topology, which says that we can find some algebraic invariants which 
can bound this topological complexity from below. So otherwise, we say we are using estimates uh, using some machinery from uh, topology. And that's how we uh, can say, in certain cases, what's going on, what could be topological complexity exactly. So would you please switch to file again, please? Yeah, yeah we defined already topological complexity. Yeah, basically, uh, this one can actually formulate this in strict mathematical terminology as well, what it means we have motion planner. So if you have some map, so-called vibration, and uh, let's look it down right here. We basically, Px means we have pass vibration, otherwise to say uh, the all possible pass understood as a topological space, which starts on one point and ends second point, and we take all points free to be possible. So we don't fix any of the points. And we can project this pass space to x times x by projecting initial point and terminal point. And namely, it creates this so-called vibration. Now, finding motion planner is equivalent to find opposite map from this smaller space up there, which will be continuously depending on each first and second coordinate. And uh, it appears that, uh, again, this is equivalent to what we are saying about that we can have globally defined motion planner. And if not, then again, we are dividing this space and we take on which subspace we can have this map so-called sections possible. And it defines so-called sectional category so that we basically have how much subspaces we need to cover the base so that we can section have section over on each path. Yeah, let me talk about uh, upper dimension at least, uh, upper lower bound. Upper lower bound uh, can be actually taken to be less than double of dimension of x plus 1. So one can produce this uh, by considering any reasonable topological space. Uh, in most cases, we, we assume that this is either manifold or at least uh, cellular complex. In certain cases, it could be just simply short complex. But uh, another lower bound which is given, it's not quite Good. So what I would like to let me talk about briefly how algebra defines lower bound and how we calculate that in certain spaces. So I'm going to go to document camera. So when we have topological space X, it's sometimes difficult to classify spaces up to homeomorphism or deformation. So what people do in topology is uh, they define algebraic invariants, so-called homology or cohomology. So we assign at each dimension so-called HI of this space with some coefficient a, let's say this will be coefficient ring, and this will be some abelian group. and consider corresponding dual space, which is cohomology. Why cohomology is better? Because we have multiplication inside. So besides 
this additive structure, one can have also multiplication and we can distinguish different algebraic structures by saying multiplication works differently in some other space. So, and this homology and cohomology are using, uh, used to distinguish between topological spaces. Now, once we have that, um, can, can you give an example? Uh, yes, uh, nice, uh, good question. Uh, so, for example, when we take ordinary space which is contractible to the point, then the whole cohomology would be just nothing but initial coefficient ring at zero degree, and anything else would be just trivial. So, for example, this cohomology of the point would be the same A when dimension when we're taking n is 0 and it would be trivial when n is larger than 0. So any, any other higher cohomology vanishes for the point or anything which is deformable to the point. Now when we have circle S1, then corresponding space would have the following dimensions. It would be A when n is 0. Basically, it will have one dimension 1 in 1 as well, so it will be base ring A when n is 1, and it will vanish anything which is larger than 1. So when we have two-dimensional sphere, then it has non-trivial cohomology or homology in zero and second dimension, and anything higher vanishes, but also middle first one vanishes as well. So now, in the sphere or in the circle, how multiplication works, that we have non-zero element in the first degree, then u times u would be just trivial. So basically, even though this is non-trivial in high dimension, just multiplication would be trivial anyway. Uh, non-trivial example would be if we take projective space, then first degree generator squared gives non-zero in second degree. Oh, there are several spaces. For example, let me uh, say again, back configuration space of endpoints on the plane. Then cohomology here is, so this is our x. So let's talk about just real coefficients, because anyway, in most cases, it will be enough to consider that this would be generated by first degree terms. And let's call this xi. Or just uh, say AI and AI AJ. Uh, there is some uh, formula which defines. So let's call it uh, AIJ, AIJ, AJ, K. Yeah, and there are some relations here. So that basically it will be one generated, and uh, there is some simplification possible in higher dimension, and. Correspondingly, multiplication uh, would be, in general, uh, non-trivial. So one thing to say, for example, what is the situation when we have torus then it basically has two independent generators. One is, let's call A here. And let's call B this one. And what actually happens is that the 
cohomology will be generated by A, B, and we also would have in second degree A, B, and uh, nothing else. Uh, that means uh, zeros and higher. Otherwise, to say the corresponding betting number on zero degree, it would be just one. In the first degree, we have only two generators, so we call that uh, this invariant would be, beta number would be two, and uh, in second level, it would be just one generated by a b product, and anything else would vanish. So whenever we take products, uh, that means the arms with several links inside, then topology is uh, going more complicated, but it's easy in the sense that we have the product of simple uh, so-called circle. Now, let me take one thing, uh, how we use lower bound using cohomology for this topological complexity. We have multiplication in the space which produces another element in this cohomology algebra. And we define zero divisor ideal and this would be kernel of mu which is subalgebra in h tensor h basically this is equivalent when we take uh, ordinary cohomology field with zero characteristic. It is the same as cohomology ring of the base space x times x when we are constructing as a point. And now, when we have this multiplication, we just take only zero divisors. Uh, this basically is a result of uh, Schwartz, who introduced so-called Schwartz genus on arbitrary vibration that this is uh, helpful to use lower bound of corresponding motion planners. And namely, we consider the kernel, and after that, we define what is cup length for this algebra. So if we have some algebra, let's call it Algebra A, which is graded, like we have cohomology here, we define cup length to be uh, the maximum number of non-zero elements, so that product is also non-zero. Otherwise, we say we take A1 times A2 times up to AK, and it is non-zero element in corresponding dimension. And additionally, dimension of AI, or just grading of the AI, let's say this way. So how do you relate this fact to the, you know, in terms, for instance, uh, let's say, in terms of your arm complex? Yes. How do you relate the, this coupling to that? Uh, in certain cases, this armor com complex is the product of circles. Right. And uh, we can say mathematically what is algebra corresponding to circles. That means so-called tori. Right. In the tori, we take actually exterior algebra right. on number of generators, which corresponds to how many rotation is possible. And after that, uh, we can define this 
what is cup's length here correspondingly and say, uh, yeah, let me define one thing. This is non zero and additional means that grading of a i is larger than zero. So that means these are not on zero degree, but rather are really representing some cohomology classes. And for example, let's say uh, simple case S1. How we calculate what that is, right? How, how we can see what are actually inside of the zero ideal. So let's take x is S1, then cohomology algebra of the product, which just S1, would be just exterior algebra generated by A1. So when we have the product, then we have exterior algebra generated by two elements. And now what we know is that, yeah, that is a uh, tensor product. So if you take element something like Z, E1 tensored 1 plus 1 tensored E2, let's say this is subtraction, and multiply by itself. Then whenever we multiply, oh, we, uh, we just use algebraic operations here, so that it will be u1 squared tensored 1. Uh, after then, it will be minus e1 tensored e2. And after that, it will be plus e2 tensored e1. And minus 1 tensored e2 squared. So what actually happens here is that uh, e1 squared would be 0. So e2 squared would be 0. And what we actually see is it will have something like uh, this kind of scenario. That the product would be uh, just vanish to zero. So basically, this means that uh, we have zero time zero cup length of S one would be still one. So that. Uh, topological complexity of S1 is larger or equal to this cohomology lower bound plus 1. In this particular scenario, it just has that it is larger than equal to 1 plus 1, which is 2. And that basically, we already checked this, that it cannot be 1 at all. In the similar case, if we have the torus, it appears that uh, if we have product of two circles, then corresponding ZCL would have dimension 2. And so on, if you take uh, n times Tn, then it would be, uh, we can calculate ZCL, basically it is n. And eventually, one can say that corresponding topological complexity of this torus, which basically corresponds to arm of n rotation possibilities, it would be larger or equal to n plus 1. And this is lower bound in this case. Now, usually, as we mentioned before, 
this invariant of the product n times is less or equal to dimension of that and double dimension plus 1, but dimension is 2. So in that case, we have that basically 2n plus 1 should be the number. So that basically we have the gap between n plus 1 and 2n plus, plus 1. And the question is how basically we can say what exactly topological complexity is. What actually happens is that uh, in this particular scenario, we are lucky in the sense that it presents the product of simple these S1s. So there is the formula which has that if we know what is motion planning on space x and y, then we can produce motion planner on corresponding product. So, and the formula says this topological complexity of x times y doesn't exceed topological complexity of x plus this of y and minus 1. And in that scenario, we take uh, two circles, then corresponding thing would be for torus would be 3, three dimensionals would be so and so on. So in this case, we can say that n-dimensional torus topological complexity would be less or equal to actually n plus 1. And that's, we can say that our lower bound, which we calculated using algebra, is actually tight and sharp and guarantees that we cannot produce less than n plus 1 possible coverage for this motion planning. Now, there is a question basically uh, when space is a little bit more complicated and not just immediate product, what can we do with respect to calculation this number? Uh, let me say what uh, result in this scenario in some certain cases, what we have. Can I switch to file, please? Yes. Yeah, basically we take uh, complex decomposition of uh, generalized tori. S could be any dimensional sphere. And let me say one thing. Uh, yeah, mo more application stuff, for example. How to generate it with respect to graph groups. So define graph group as to be the group we whenever we have the graph in the plane and say it is simply shell graph. We take generators of which to be how many nodes we have, and we define uh, points commute if they are connected by corresponding edges. And we basically, it is called so called rectangle arting group as well. Sometimes I use as a graph group. And we want to calculate uh, what is topological complexity of corresponding classification space and uh, one can actually prove that this is equal to z of gamma plus 1. Uh, what mathematically one can say, we take this graph and see how many maximum complete subgraphs it has and what is higher dimension of that, right? So for example, when we have complete graph, then it is already n. If there is some more mixture of the graph, then it might have several complete subgraphs. And z of gamma represents actually how many points we can cover by exactly two complete subgraphs. And this will guarantee that this is a minimal number of coverage of corresponding complex x gamma corresponding to this graph group. And this is actually one of the subcomplexes 
of the torus complex and uh, the way we show actually is that uh, the motion planning which is defined on the torus usually it's not so easily to say that it is transferable to subspaces in general like we had previously so that whenever we have one dimensional sphere in, an, in two dimensional sphere as a subcomplex then topological complexity of the smaller space doesn't necessarily is the same as larger space or vice versa whenever we have odd dimensional sphere of dimension 3 it has subsphere dimension 2 but two dimensional sphere has complexity 3 which is different from odd dimensional sphere which is 2 so even though we have subspace of the space topological complexity might be still larger for the subspace cases and uh, in this particular scenario we take subcomplexes and we show that uh, subcomplexes whatever motion plan is defined for minimal torus subdivision it actually transfers down to low dimensional cases as well which in general is not the case as I mentioned already yeah there's another example but I don't want to uh, talk about it it is uh, we calculate similar spaces uh, which is similar to braid groups and can be calculated by using uh, cohomology dimension of corresponding things. Yeah, recent developments is that um, sometimes cohomology dimension is not as tight as, let me say, quite, yeah, uh, is not as tight as uh, we want to be. So one introduced corresponding uh, weighted classes, not just simple cohomology classes, and use that to increase lower bound to m try to make produce sharp bounds so that we can predict exactly how much would be topological complexity of this uh, particular system. And the generalization I, I didn't mention here, uh, there's defined so-called symmetric motion planner Symmetric means that uh, this path which we choose assigning how to switch from one configuration to another, symmetricity would mean we want actually to go backwards with the same path. So otherwise to say if we rotate this point to here, this position to here this way, we want to go backward exactly the same way or whatever we can define by inverse path. And this actually defines a little bit more slightly different number which is not necessarily matching to this topology complexity which we defined here. And one can study of that invariant and uh, see how that works and uh, how one can compare to other spaces. Yeah, of course, um, there will be some question how, I guess most likely, how that actually helps, how it can be implemented. Yeah, I do not have exact um, answer, but uh, one way is that one can program and say this motion planners uh, would guarantee that in any position we can switch from here to here and in several scenarios maybe one can say if there is some additional complexities going on and some other unexpected situation define additional motion planners which uh, correspondingly translate to corresponding action of this complex of robot uh, system whatever one can work with Yeah, I just want to say um, brief literature and uh, yeah, basically a nice introduction would be invitation of topological robotics by Farber and the result uh, we had this um, in these two papers and there is some more work going on to study topological complexity of the larger of different com topological spaces. Oh, yeah, one can actually do additionally what, for example, Faber did recently is uh, to study what's going on with random graphs and what is corresponding configuration spaces and calculate topological complexity of random graphs, for example, or random situations, because sometimes uh, yeah, it might be interesting what's going on in a large time scale. Yeah, and I want to um, thank you for listening and uh, if you have any questions. Yeah.
Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Any questions? Questions? Yes, sir. You've talked about the circle. Yes. But the end motion of the robot might, in fact, be um, a composite of a number of circles. So the motion might. Can I draw it down? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. Give me a paper, piece of paper. And you <laughs> can show that, right? So the end motion, because of the circles or, or parts of the circle, could look. The subspace can look like this. And your tori would be. So, could you deal with that? With your theories? Maybe you should show it on Show it on there. Ah, you mean um, configuration phase of what? Of the end effector of the robot. Ah. Uh -huh. Could be there. That's your space. That's your subspace. Oh, basically, uh, it would be a little bit more, yeah, good question. Yeah, in this particular scenario, Ask him to show it on the screen. actually, I can see right now that uh, this actually is topologically equivalent right. to just we should maybe full disk. We should maybe show the overhead, oh, yes. overhead. Yeah, overhead, please. So we have this space, right? I can tell right now immediately that this is topologically equivalent. Actually, it is homeomorphic by not just deformation to squeeze down some stuff, but rather maintain on the whole topology to just full disk. And therefore, in our case, um, one can define one globally defined motion uh, on the whole entire space. So in this particular case, topological complexity of this situation would be just one. So this is something which is a little bit more manageable in one coverage. And uh, otherwise to say how, how we actually define nicely motion cover on a plane, right, on convex object. We just say we have two configurations from here to here. This is convex. We can connect with the shortest line. What line actually would mean here in the sense which we transfer from this identification to here, it would be some kind of car, but at least it would be uniquely defined coming from backward. Did I answer your question? Yeah. yeah, I don't know how exactly. OK, the question actually would be how efficient that is with respect to energy, or it's actually good and shortest one. That's actually a different question to consider. Otherwise, to say how we really like that, or we actually want to have something which preserves more energy because um, here short as this might be a different thing, right? Yeah, but uh, theoretically one can show that this is possible to have global defined things so that there is no conflict in this one arm. Or if there is combination of that, that means if there is linkage which each one can rotate that way, then the whole thing also would have one global defined thing because the product would be bounded by corresponding sums minus ones and corresponding things. So one can say that um, several cooperation of this and even adding to shifting horizontally as well would have still trivial topological complexity. So yes. one can turn, I have a question. So one then can turn uh, uh, the question on its head in a sense where if, if you impose a constraint, say for instance as you mentioned, you, can, uh, you impose an energy constraint, then you can uh, perhaps optimize the space of uh, of your configuration? Is that is that an easy question? I mean, yeah, actually, it is not what we have done work I, I yet. But that. but actually, I would say uh, this situation is nice in the sense that when we have uh, our definition, it allows that if we deform something, topological complexity stays unchanged. Once we introduce geometry inside an optimization with that, then it will heavily depend on what geometry is going on what kind of optimization function we take and I what we minimize. Yeah. And it would not be, I, I believe it will jump dimension higher, but what would be low and upper bound and how to calculate that, it will, should depend on each particular scenario, I guess. Any other question? 
All yeah, right. of course, correspondent will bound it always with this topological lower bound, but upper bound might be way higher. And therefore, we cannot tell exactly how much. Yeah, of course, sometimes one can say, OK, we are happy with having um, several disconnected motions and that way, but sometimes it's not quite a good idea. I yes? I do have a question. In terms of um, the topological complexity, this is purely mathematical in terms of it. And I think what Dr. Grant was going to on this diagram is that uh, in any physical robot, you're going to have limits you to, your, to your constraints yeah. to, your, to your effectors, to your motors. You're not going to be able to, usually they will not be able to rotate as on a circle, a circle. 180 yeah. degrees. Yeah. And so, you're not, if you, so when you're talking about your S1 plan, you're not going to be able to go from your shortest path may not be the shortest path in a pure circle. It may, you may have to go all the way around. So in terms of your topological transformations, I mean, are, are all your, is all your work in ideal situations and does not take constraints? Oh, okay. That? Let me say one thing then corresponding to that to answer something different. Can I do for <laughs> one quick minute? <laughs> okay. Assuming, yeah, exactly. Good question. But uh, let's say why actually we want to study arbitrary space, not just necessarily the simple stuff, right? When we have several points on the plane, then corresponding configuration space is definitely, that means when we have several robots understood as the points, then definitely underlying uh, configuration space is not topologically trivial. And for example, if we take the graph here, this is a work by Greist and Abram, and we take just two robots, and we want, and each one just works linearly through this, and one is, for example, red and one is black, and we want to consider what is configuration space of that. Let me briefly draw the picture. It would be uh, something like this. And connects to this. Uh, this center is removed. And additionally, it has additional extensions here and each sixth one. So what actually it represents? When there were these two robots are at different edges, then they can arbitrarily freely transform each one around each leg, uh, each edge, so that we basically have each particular uh, par parallelogram, this particular region. But whenever they are on the same leg, on the same edge, then we cannot swap around but because one is close to another. How we actually we do that, we still have the corresponding thing. That exactly corresponds to this triangles with removed upper edge. But topologically, whatever we created here, it has a hole inside. Onside hole means basically that these two robots cannot be at the center simultaneously, right? It actually is homotopy equivalent to S1. So whatever topological complexity of this configuration is, is basically the same as calculating topological complexity of S1, which you already have done, to be 2. So um, in general, even though this maybe it's not necessarily the linkage corresponding, but it corresponds to some other configuration space, which is topologically reducible to S1. Or if you have some uh, product of that situation, then we correspondingly have tori and so on. Is that a fine answer to your question? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, of course, there will be another question. How actually we transfer from this homotopy this motion plan to that, but one can actually do that by construct this corresponding path and move upward. So once we have this, yeah. The only thing is that if, if configure if the space where robots are actually going on changes, even though topologically the same, configuration space corresponding might be different. So even though this graph itself is contractible to the point, configuration space here is not the same as two robots running around in a plane, which would create a situation like, uh, yeah, let me talk, not talk about, but uh, again, this differs in general. Okay, well, if there are no more questions, we'll thank our speaker again. Thank you.